Why would we want to do it? Well, we want to reduce the through life costs. That's the area that we're considering. So ultimately, in terms of this diagram, we've got an allowable defect size somewhere here, and that's governed by our assessment of the structure. And what we want to try and do is try and get back and start using all of the stress that we have within it. I sort of said before about the uh, intelligent structures. I have another example here as well, just to hand around. Again, it's a, a bistable structure, but now we're starting to think. I wasn't sure. This is one way that we're looking at it, trying to use composites to form a bistable state so you can morph it. But equally, you could start to use a, start to use a cellular structure. So cellular structure here can then be deformed. Because of the way that these cells behave under a loading, the, the actual arm length shortens, and the shortening of the arm length gives you the change in profile. So you can start to trigger it. But of course, morphing structures, many possibilities. You could start to use morphing structures within the body itself. Uh, people started com uh, to consider, in, in terms of the medical environment, how you could start to put it into the, into the spine and use the exotic behavior of the material. You're also looking at um, the oxetic behavior of material in terms of an impact event and how it will absorb the energy within the structure. And then you've got hierarchical structures. So these structures now are starting to have, um, at a different length scale to what we've previously had, we're starting to have reinforcement. So we're having reinforcement at the nano length scale. And this then starts to impart completely different types of properties to what we've experienced to date. So why do it? Why have intelligent structures? Why do we do it? Well, composites, because of this ability to lay down different layers at different times, you can integrate more functionality. So the functionality could minimize part numbers or different materials. You could also develop safer intelligent structures. By that, I mean you start to put the interrogation system with inside it, and it can start to understand the load that's going through it and start to warn you when things are going wrong. And also, you could start to look at nature. I, I won't hand this sample around, it's a bit big, but typically... Intelligent structure, why do we have to make structures that in sort of the metallic way where the fibres are aligned in 90 and 45 degrees? If you look across at the braiding technology or the stitching technology, then you can start to lay fibres down in any direction you want. And if you do that, you start to embrace some of the ideas and philosophies that come out of nature. Manufacturing, a lot of work that's going on in our manufacturing is to try and take... Um, and simplify the software. So you're saying, I have a part, I want to make it out of composite, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, I'm not sure how my waste is going to occur on my scrap rates. We have software, virtual fabric placement, that can actually put down uh, the, soft, uh, the plies in a, on, on a computer screen to explain to you how they will drape, how they will perform, and that can be then fed back into the computer modelling as well. As I said, composite processing and characterisation sort of feeds back into the other themes as well. But we're looking at material development. How do you control these materials? We're starting to explore. The concept in composites is that you just have circular fibres. Well, perhaps circular fibres aren't the best way to absorb energy to stop crack propagation. So we're starting to look at novel uh, fibre construction, fibre cross-sectional areas. We have a stitching machine. That's what's generated this. It can lay down material in any direction. We have final year student projects sort of trying to develop but, uh, structures um, that would buckle in a way that we can control them. So we have novel manufacturing routes. Of course, we're interested in and we're exploiting automation. Composites have to be automated and the production rates have to be increased to meet the demand for the future, especially within the aerospace sector. As I said, we're developing new functionalities, structural health monitoring. We've got to Im improve the, the scrap rate. Composites are a very expensive material. We need to understand how we can minimise this. And as I mentioned as well, we support all other activities. Concluding remarks. Development of both concept, concepts and applications is forging ahead at Bristol. Primarily within the engineering department, but we have input from both life sciences and chemistry. There are still significant challenges within our industry to understand in-service performance and how to achieve low-cost manufacture. We are again making progress in both these areas. Over the last 40 years, composites have um, started to explore or started to be uh, considered as a material of choice, and the possibilities of achieving what they can do is now starting to be realised. It's been very, coming very clear that rapid advances to date are uh, we're only the beginning. There is an enormous untapped, untapped potential for developing future solutions as composites 
start to mature. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Um, equally, if you want me to hand out any more of the samples, please say so. Thank you. I, re I really like what you're doing because the uh, you know, traditional methods of looking for crack detection uh, you know, are fairly well established in the aerospace industry and the, the damage in composites can be at a, 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 at a micro level. Yes. Um, and so that can cut, contribute to a catastrophic event. Do you look at the self-healing process as being a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime event or, or would you have some kind of pump system that would continue to repair, you know, sort of micro damage on an ongoing basis? At the moment, we do both at Bristol. Uh, we have looked at, it, uh, looked at it as a sort of a compartmentalised, one-shot okay. approach healing. We've also used and integrated peristaltic pumps within composite sandwich structures. So the sandwich, this, this being a sandwich structure, it permits you greater freedom between the composite skins mm -hmm. to integrate a pumping device um, and feedback control. We've, we've done that, again, with a considerable success. With uh, composite sandwich structures, the problem is restabilizing the skin. Yeah. And by actually putting a pressure in behind it to pump the fluid through the system, you pop the skin back and you gain additional benefits. Our challenge in the next 12 months is to do much the same on the laminate scale. We can put la networks into the laminates, yeah. but attaching the pumping, the heart, is what we have to do in the next 12 months. Well, that's our desire in the next 12 months. I guess it's fairly obvious then that if you're able to get a system that works, you're going to be able to look at weight further weight reduction by reducing the amount of composites being used. That's the objective, yeah. is at the moment composites are designed for that sort of critical defect size. They're over-engineered, yeah. and we want to start... Yes, there will be a mass penalty of introducing a healing potential, although we believe it's quite minimal. The aim is to then minimise the composites that are there to sort of for the rainy day sort of situation. Yeah. Yeah, hi, hi Richard. Um, I, I'm interested in the uh, bit around the industrial partnerships. Um, okay. We had we had uh, Colin Green talking uh, this morning about the importance of us trying to get our companies engaged with the likes of, of, of your centre and the work that you're doing there. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on, on how those industrial relationships work and maybe if there's any lessons there that we can learn about getting other companies involved. Um, we have, I suppose, at, at the top level, we have certain... Uh, we call them UTC, so they're technology centres with certain companies. Um, we have one with Rolls-Royce and we have one with GE. It was Smith's when it first commenced. Um, equally, uh, we're heavily involved with Airbus. So that's the big players out of the way, shall we say. Um, is that we're becoming more and more involved with the smaller companies and those do seem to come through us through single points of contact through events like this. Um, our final year student body is very good in terms of kick-starting some ideas and some projects. Um, we find they're particularly a very good group of students, um, very motivated, and if you were to say, I have a company that wants to give you the time and the effort to sort of introduce you to a problem, um, it looks great for them in terms of what they have to do for the project and also on their CV. So we're starting to find our final year projects are starting to be picked up by smaller industries, um, but typically through word of mouth. Um, the door's always open. I mean, I suppose you can go and have a look on our website, come and see us. We're not that nasty an organisation. There are, there are a few old guys and there's a few young guys like me. I, I would suggest you speak to the young guys, of course. Um, but come in and see us, see what we do. You know, we're in, a, we're in a rapid change at Bristol. We've got a huge development going on in composites. Um, engineering is changing quite rapidly. So whatever perceptions you have of us, I think we'd probably break them. <laughs>